question for you. If you stumbled upon this landscape, where would you think you were? The answer is probably obvious given what kind of stories I tell, but humor me here. The pillowy rocks, the cracked veins, the endless water, the hills. Plants aside, this feels like the kind of landscape you should see in, I don't know, Hawaii or Iceland. Definitely not the upper peninsula of Michigan, but that's exactly where we are. This is Presque Isle Point, aka Black Rocks. It's in the city of Marquette, and it's a place that has fascinated me from the moment I first stepped foot here. The problem? I couldn't find good information about where this place came from or how it formed. So I called for some help. Hey, Dr. Cannon, it's Alexis Gall. This is the story of Black Rocks, but it's also a story about humans and how we're able to string together what the Earth was like a billion years ago. It's also a story about all the ways this corner of the planet has changed since then. And even more surprisingly, all the ways it hasn't. It's story time. No one knows exactly how old Black Rocks is because no one has made a definitive measurement of the rocks. But by comparing this area to rocks that have been dated, some researchers have made an educated guess that the dark rock you see here is about 1.1 billion years old. So we'll begin our story around there. At this time, this part of the world was likely flat and relatively barren. The ground was made of rocks that were already at least a billion years old themselves. And while there may have been some fungi decorating those rocks, land plants hadn't evolved yet. So things were pretty quiet. Then a great blob of magma likely rose up from the mantle and intruded into those ancient rocks. The magma probably didn't break the surface, so if you were standing here, you might not realize anything was happening. But over time, that magma cooled, solidified, and formed a mass of material likely about the size of Presque Isle. That rock is called peridotite, and as the millennia progressed, the crust above this peridotite gradually eroded until the almost island we see today was exposed. This is the basic story for how Presque Isle likely formed, but it's anything but the whole story. In fact, I don't even think this is the most interesting version, because there are so many weird looking features at Black Rocks in particular that this explanation doesn't cover. That's the stuff I wanted to understand, and this is where I started developing a sense of deja vu. To learn more about this place, I reached out to Dr. Bill Cannon. He's a scientist emeritus with the U.S. Geological Survey, and although his career has taken him all kinds of places, he's been studying Michigan's Upper Peninsula on and off since the late 1960s. He's one of the most knowledgeable people I know, and I had the privilege of learning from him in 2021 when I made a video about the Sudbury impact. So I figured he might be able to help me understand Black Rocks, or at least would know somebody who could. Well, fast forward a couple of months, and Dr. Dr. Cannon was once again opening my eyes to just how amazing this region is. I met Dr. Cannon at Sunset Point on Presque Isle, a place formerly known to me as the spot where I park my car. In other words, I had given exactly no real thought to it, which I quickly realized had been a big mistake on my part. Okay, so this, this unit is the Jacobsville Sandstone, which is roughly a billion years old, maybe maybe a little bit younger, we don't really know. This is the top of the prototype, this stuff down here, and the, on which we get, we're guessing is about 1.1 billion. So it might be 1.1, the sandstones are one, so it's about 100 million years yeah. of gap in here. This sort of gap in the geologic record is called an unconformity, and they're interesting, but not all that rare. An unconformity can happen if, say, a bunch of rock up at the surface is eroded and effectively disappears before the next rock layer is put down. In fact, that's exactly what happened here. A lot of the peridotite broke apart and weathered away before a river swept in and deposited all the sand that would become Jacobsville sandstone. But anyway, more from Dr. Cannon. Getting here you can see the, why don't we walk over? So here's another spot to see the unconformity, and so here are the here are the sandstone is almost directly on the on the uh, peridotite. So this would be sandstone, and is this the peridotite? This is probably or more well, sandstone. I think that's the weathered. Okay. The very top of the peridotite. Okay. Right there, and it's very it's very broken down chemically. Right. From being at the being at the surface. Cool. So in addition to that, this stuff I'm standing on right here. Okay is uh, what in a geologic term it's a regolith which means it's kind of weathered broken material okay. sort of trying to become a soil 
that was developed on top of this nephritidite is quite unstable in uh, near the Earth's surface, so it breaks down. So this was kind of like a loose, gravelly surface. Okay. And some of this very basal part of the Jacobsville sandstone filtered down in around them. So the interesting thing, if you stood on this surface a billion years ago, you'd be at the Earth's surface then. Oh, too. cool. So, Neat. And then you know, shortly after that, there was a river system that deposited the sandstone oh, okay. that gradually began to inundate this area and then it builds up. And then another interesting thing is that, not from studies right here, but from studies around the region, we know that if we were here a billion years ago, we would have been near the equator and in a desert. Cool. So, so my understanding, just the definition of a desert is just area, an area without a lot of rainfall? It's just an arid area, yeah. Okay, yeah. how do we, how can we tell this area was arid then? can't tell it from right here, okay. but there's other features in both the sedimentary and the volcanic rocks that uh, usually only form in very arid uh, oh. environments. And we know what was near the equator for because of paleomagnetic studies, that is the, when um, a lava flow, for instance, when it solidifies and cools, mm -hmm. it passes a certain temperature and it locks in the Earth's magnetic field at that oh, time. This method is actually really cool. So once a lava cools down past a certain point, called the Curie point, the magnetite in that lava locks in a record of the Earth's magnetic field. Essentially, it knows, quote unquote, which way is north. And even as the continents move and that lava rock travels to a new place on the globe, it's still pointing to wherever north was when it cooled. So by looking at a lava rock and comparing that to what they know about the Earth's magnetic field, geologists can get a sense of where a lava originated. And when they look at lava rocks from this area from about a billion years ago, that's a big part of what tells them that modern day Michigan used to be near the equator. I always find it kind of fascinating as a geologist to think, well, if I, I could have been here a billion years ago, right. and I could have been standing right here on this surface. Yeah. And if I looked around the area, all these, pretty much these hills would be more or less the same as they are now. Really? They've been sculpted a little bit by glaciers, but this topography was here a billion years ago, too. Really? And yeah. is that just because it's all volcanic? Or uh, just... Well, it was it was eroded into these hills. Okay, sure. But yep. then it was all covered up by the Jacobsville sandstone. Okay. So it was all that topography was underneath the thick pile of sandstone uh -huh. until pretty recently, probably during the ice ages, when the, the ice gouged it back out and, and uh, re-exposed that topography. Cool. Moments like this are gold for me. It's where I really feel myself starting to understand the place and start to appreciate it in a whole new way. It's also just fascinating to learn how geologists can study something that happened so far in the past. Now, most of the rock at Presque Isle Point has changed significantly in the past billion plus years. It used to be made almost entirely of the mineral olivine, which you might recognize from its gem form, peridot. But today, most of that has been chemically altered and turned into the mineral serpentine, which has the same chemical composition, but is more stable. If you're curious, the transformation of olivine to serpentine is called serpentinization, which I think is just lovely. After this, Dr. Cannon and I walked over to Black Rocks proper. The rocks here used to be farther underground than the peridotite at Sunset Point, and they haven't been up at the surface as long. So this peridotite is more fresh looking and doesn't have the same veining as rocks elsewhere. Going into this video, I really thought that this was going to be the most interesting part of the afternoon. The rocks here are just so weird, but then, this happens. Geologically, it's not as interesting out here. Now it's all pretty much all one thing. <laughs> I also find that somewhat fascinating because you're like, well, or I, I guess my perspective over here, I'm like, wow, this is this is super cool. This is super interesting. It just Lots looks rocks, but they're all the same. Yeah, and you're so, like, well, you know. <laughs> so this is sort of like reading the same page of a history book over and over again. Okay, you know, it's interesting history, but it's one thing. I mean, I, I think the surfaces that we're walking on, the, the top of these is probably almost the glaciated surface. Uh, it's in the, it all kind of smoothed down, so I think that's where the glacier was passing over it. After this, we walked over to an area I've been curious about for ages. This section of rocky beach has really weathered looking peridotite on one side and much fresher looking rock on the other. Dr. Cannon pointed out that this region on the left has been a lot more chemically altered. And here's one way he could tell. So here's one of, one of our geology tools. <laughs> It's a stud finder, a magnet. Oh, is it? And some, they probably altered too much here to be very magnetic, but I think if we tried that over there on those other rocks, it would be. You can try that if you want. Oh, yeah. I know you can. Okay. Curious. 
Yeah, you can see these are these are attracting the magnet. Oh, okay. So the magnets on the bottom. The magnets on the bottom. Yeah. Oh, cool. So one one way you can map these then is by by their magnetic pattern. Okay. Because uh, you can either do it on the ground carrying a magnetometer, going back and forth, or uh, mostly done now it's from aircraft. One of the ways that uh, you get magnetite in a rock like this is as the, the original olivine breaks down. Olivine is a magnesium iron silicate, and uh, the uh, serpentine the forms from usually has more magnesium. So it frees up some iron, and the iron ends up as, as mostly as a mineral magnetite. So if you look at a, a section of this under a microscope, you would probably see that there's very little, very tiny, dusty grains of magnetite scattered okay. all through it, and that's what, what the gifts of that magnetic attraction. Something I've been trying to practice lately is not being afraid to ask follow-up questions. Like, I could have learned the basic story of Presque Isle and Black Rocks from the beginning of this video, and then just called it a day. But by not allowing myself to continue being curious, I would have missed out on an adventure and a better understanding of one of my favorite places in Marquette. Overall, Black Rocks is a bit like a puzzle that geologists still don't have all the pieces to, but that's a big part of what fascinates me about it. I mean, there are still opportunities for scientists to come out here and learn new pieces of the story. And I don't know, something about the potential of the undiscovered really just gets to me. And you know what I think is maybe the coolest part of all? Wherever you are in the world, I bet there's a place like that near you. Thanks for joining me for my first story of 2023, and many thanks to Vlogbrothers for sponsoring this video. If you'd like to help me tell more stories like this in the new year, there are two major things you can do to help. One is to share this video if you liked it to help more folks find my work, and the other is you can click the link on screen or in the description to learn more about Patreon and buy me a coffee. The latter doesn't literally buy me coffees, just for the record. <laughs> One way or another, I'm glad you're here. I hope you learned something that makes you think about the world just a little differently, and I'll see you next time.